Industry Canada and Ofcom, three organizations that have already embarked on the process of making TV white spaces happen. I think there are a lot of lessons learned. I think there's a lot of opportunity to ask questions and find out what's working, what's not working. And just so you understand what we're doing now, it's a, it's a, a little bit of a high wire act because we have Ira Keltz uh, from the FCC who is in Washington, DC. We have Rima Hafez from Industry Canada who's in Ottawa, both joining us over video. And then we have here in the room, Professor Nwana who will also be presenting. So first, let me give a brief introduction for Ira and then have him go ahead. So Ira is Deputy Chief of the FCC's Office of OET. In his role, he assists in managing multiple divisions of engineers, attorneys, economists, and development of telecommunications policies for spectrum use in the United States. Um, he's responsible for balancing these engineering policy and public interest issues to implement national policy for non-federal spectrum users as well. So in particular, I've worked very closely with Ira as we at Google and other database providers have developed TV white space infrastructure in the United States. And I have to say, Ira is extremely knowledgeable and has been very helpful in making this process successful. So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Ira. Uh, thanks, Alan. And, uh, I guess good morning, everybody. So, um, really uh, pleased to be able to address you, even uh, by remote. So, what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the experience we've had in the United States in uh, developing and implementing the TV white space concept uh, and getting to where we are today. Um, so, you know, to be, you know, to begin with. Uh, several years ago, actually, my, my boss came in and said, hey, wh what do you think about putting some unlicensed devices in, in the TV spectrum? Uh, you know, it's not being used everywhere. And we kind of thought about it and said, well, you know, it sounds, sounds like a good idea, but, um, you know, we thought there'd be a lot of resistance uh, from incumbent users, TV uh, stations. Um, uh, we have wireless micro microphone users in the band and so forth. But the more we thought about it, you know, the more we thought this could re really provide opportunities for, for folks to provide uh, another way of providing some broadband connectivity. So, you know, we, we embarked on this, it's been a fairly long process. So the, the idea was that you know, we could find unused spectrum called white spaces and basically build on some of the dynamic spectrum access techniques that people had been talking about for years and find a way to combine those and and try to try to make something happen and provide opportunities for folks so we've gone ahead and done that while protecting the folks uh, already using the band and uh and we've gotten to essentially the, the first world you know first implementation in in the world of using the unlicensed white space in the tv band for you know, for, uh, for connectivity. So one of the reasons we did this is we saw lots of benefits, uh, you know, down in the 600, 500 megahertz band, uh, really good propagation, uh, better than some of the higher bands that were already being used for unlicensed. Um, a lot of the U.S. had lots of open spectrum uh, outside of the major markets, the big cities. Uh, the, the TV density wasn't that large, so there were lots of opportunities. Um, and given that we were starting to license the 700 megahertz band and other bands that were close, we, we thought it was a good opportunity to provide some, some synergies with uh, the, the licensed providers. Uh, in addition to that, as we've been embarking on this, the IEEE 802.22 has developed a standard that, uh, you know, for the TV white space uh, technology, uh, which actually won a uh, emerging technology award. So, so things were starting to fall in place to, to make this happen. Uh, you know, in, in doing this also, we saw all kinds of applications, uh, you know, especially given the propagation for, um, you know, and, and the long distances that can be covered with not a whole lot of power. Uh, you know, we, we saw opportunities for smart grid, for, uh, for uh, long distance uh, learning, for uh, uh, machine to machine, um, you know, for, for medical applications, uh, 
ba basically anything you could imagine, people had all kinds of ideas. So, uh, so we really wanted to follow through. So the basic concept is that we have TV channels um, that are allotted in various cities, but not all are used at any given time. And we have the incumbents of the TV stations. We have full power and low power. Um, we also have wireless microphones using the spectrum. But in between all that, we had the white space. So, you know, you can see from the picture that it, you know, it's kind of, you know, it, uh, we have, uh, you know, these six megahertz chunks between channels. And the trick here is that it's different in every city as you move across the U.S. In fact, it's different from point to point, even within cities. And just for as an illustration here, taking two two of our larger markets, uh, the 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 red shows where we have full station TV, great. But um, the yellow would be where uh, there are channels open, as well as the green, uh, where TV white space could operate. Now these are two of the larger markets, so there's limited availability for TV white space devices. But in some of the smaller markets, for example, on the bottom. Uh, we talk about uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, we had 25 channels available for 150 megahertz of, of use for unlicensed. So again, we, we just really thought this was a really good opportunity that we should take advantage of. So some of the challenges we were facing in, in implementing this was there are lots of different ways for these devices that could to interfere with the, with the existing users. Uh, we had co-channel interference and figuring out how far away from TV stations, both full power and low power TV, do we need to keep these TV white space devices to ensure not causing interference to, to television viewers. Uh, similarly, we had adjacent channel interference issues. You know, how, how do we control the emissions into the adjacent channels? Uh, how far away do you need to be from TV viewers? At what power levels? Uh, and also uh, wireless microphones we have very prevalent in this band which are used for uh, uh, electronic news gathering, for TV, uh, Broadway shows, uh, live performances, concerts, and we needed to pre protect them. Our, our original concept was to base this on, on sensing technology to allow the white space device to sense the use of the spectrum and then determine on its own whether the channel was available or not. What we found um, is that we, we, we had an extensive testing program uh, where several companies um, produced prototypes and we, we extensively tested these both in the lab and in the field. And we found a lot of issues with sensing. Uh, basically, we found, we found that it, it just wasn't quite ready for full implementation uh, from a technical standpoint for, for several reasons. Um, we, we found that they took a long time to determine uh, if channels were available based on the algorithms they were implementing, sometimes in the order of minutes per channel, meaning it, it took almost an hour sometimes to scan the TV spectrum. So you couldn't have any assurance that uh, it, once you went to go use a channel, it was actually available. Uh, also, there were difficulties in sensing the use of the, the wireless microphones. Um, also, we found issues with um, strong adjacent channel signals. So if you were on a, or you thought you were on, a, um, on, on an open channel, if there was a strong TV signal in the adjacent channel, it, uh, it created uh, false, false positives in, in the uh, receivers which um, caused some issues. Also, from a technical standpoint, we ran into many issues uh, so with, with the, the incumbents, the TV stations, uh, in determining um, you know, what level to sense at, to determine if below what level to say there was or was not a signal present. Um, and then how do you measure that? What type of measuring device? What kind of uh, detector? what is the integration time, the resolution bandwidth of, of the detector, and so on and so forth. And it just became too difficult to resolve. 
So ultimately, what we decided is to base the use of the TV white spaces on geolocation and database lookup. So the idea was that we could have a database that had all the TV stations as well as any other station we wanted to protect in it, uh, along with the parameters we determined um, as, uh, as safe separation distances. The device would have some sort of geolocation capability like GPS, and, and, and by using that, uh, it could determine, if once it knew where it was, could check the database, and then the database could say, could tell it uh, whether, you know, what channels it was safe to operate on in its location. Uh, the database themselves would then have that channel calculator and also be able to register devices for protection. Uh, and that we found necessary because some of the uh, um, uh, operations we needed to protect in the band were not licensed by us, so we didn't have records of them in a database. Uh, and these were things like um, uh, so, some received sites for various stations for uh, low power TV and TV translators, um, received sites rather than the transmit site. So once we kind of figured all that out, we got the final rules adopted a couple years ago in 2010, uh, modified them slightly uh, in, in 2012, um, and codified our, our rules for the incumbent services to be protected and white space devices to operate. So since then, you know, we've um, implemented these rules. We have fixed devices uh, and we have uh, mobile portable devices. Uh, and the rules are slightly different. For the fixed devices, we, we allow up to four watts of, of uh, radiated power. And we let them operate uh, throughout the TV spectrum uh, with the exception of a few channels where we were protecting some, some other uh, operations. And for fixed devices, uh, we have the added restriction that they can only operate if they have a free TV channel on either side. This was done because of the higher power, the four watts, uh, with the out-of-band emissions in order to protect uh, TV stations. Uh, so uh, a little bit different on the personal portable mobile type devices. They operated much less power, 100 milliwatts uh, if they don't have a TV channel adjacent or for 40 milliwatts if they do. Again, this was done to protect uh, the TV uh, reception. Uh, also, we restricted these just to channels 21 and above. Uh, and, and that was done for various reasons. Uh, in, in the U.S., we have some incumbents below 20, uh, some land mobile operations and public safety that we were trying to protect. Uh, and then we have two types of, of portable devices, mode one and mode two. So the, uh, the mode two, I'll start with that, uh, they actually have the geolocation capability built in, and we allowed for a mode one type device, which doesn't have the geolocation capability, but has to connect to either a fixed device or a mode two device and, and use that as a pass through to the database to get the, ge ge the geolocation coordinates and the, uh, the, the available channels. Uh, and we, we allowed that to, because with the low power levels, the idea was those links are gonna be very short and in the local area, the, the available channels will be the same as the device that they're getting the information from. So the, the other thing we needed to protect was wireless microphones. Um, and this became a, a real issue because there's extensive usage, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, in the entertainment industry. And so what we did is we created a way for microphones to register within the database and you know, for the times when they're needed, whether it's a sporting event, uh, a, a play, a concert, and for the time that they are in operation, we would protect uh, we would protect them, and the database would prevent TV white space device from operating nearby. So, so with all that, we then get to the database administrators, which are really key to making this happen. So we uh, we we gave authorization, or we conditionally designated ten entities to provide uh, and serve as, as database administrators, and um, and. They, they started building databases. This included folks like Google, uh, as well as Spectrum Bridge and uh, a number of other uh, companies. Um, and they worked very closely with us. We held many workshops 
to um, iron out um, places where the rules uh, may have either not been quite understood or they had questions. And uh, the database administrators also worked very cooperatively together to figure out how to implement uh, our rules because one of the keys to having multiple database administrators were number one, that if a device came to the you know, came to one uh, database to find the available channels. Um, if it went to a different one, it has to get the same answer. We had to make sure that the database were all operating, uh, you know, identically in that respect. Also, because we had uh, we had other uh, operations being registered, we had a requirement that the database had to share certain data so that they all had a picture of the spectrum at any given point in time, uh, again, in order to ensure that the same answer was provided to any, any device looking to see where they can operate. And that was real key to making this work. So um, the, the databases, uh, we've, uh, had, we've authorized two of them already. Um, we've done this through extensive uh, internal testing. Once we're satisfied that they're working well, we put them out for a, a public test, open to the, the public. Uh, actually, it's open worldwide. Uh, we put out a public notice to invite people to try them out and then solicit comment. Uh, we found a number of issues that the administrators have gone and, uh, and taken care of as that's happened. Uh, and then we, uh, we, have, we put out a report, and then we'll, we actually approve the databases. So um, at this point, uh, where we are is you know, as I mentioned, we've adopted the final rules. We have uh, two fixed devices that have actually been approved. We have more devices in the pipeline going through our equipment approval process. We have approved two databases uh, for full you know, U.S. nationwide coverage uh, from Spectrum Bridge and Telcordia. Uh, yesterday, we put out a public notice, uh, in the, which is the final step for approving Google's database and Key Bridge's database. So that should be done relatively relatively soon. Uh, we're, we'll then have four of our 10 database administrators fully operating throughout the US. Um, and so, so all that work is continuing uh, on. Uh, so that, that's pretty much the experience we've had. To, to date, I think it's been pretty successful. Uh, you know, we've got uh, a number of implementations for doing meter reading, connecting schools, uh, connecting city parks, a, a whole bunch of things. Uh, and, and here I've just got a, a number of links off our website uh, where you can go to find a lot more information. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then uh, I guess after the rest, I uh, hope to answer your questions. Uh, thanks a lot. Please give Ira a hand. Thank you, Ira. That was, that was really excellent. And um, please stay on. If, if hope, God willing, that all the technology works. And after all the presentations, we'll have some Q&A. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, Rima Hafez. She's currently manager of fixed wireless systems in the Spectrum Engineering Branch at Industry Canada. She's worked for Industry Canada for the last 14 years. And she will be speaking today about Industry Canada's deployment of TV white spaces. So with that, I'd like to invite Rima to, to come speak. Thanks, Alan. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, bon après-midi à vous tous. Je suis très content d'être ici de vous présenter sur les espaces blancs au Canada. So, thanks. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to present today on Industry Canada's White Space Initiative. So, before I get into what we've done so far, I'd like to just give you an idea of who we are and how things are done here. So. Basically, the government has many departments here, and the Department of Industry is the one that is responsible for spectrum management, and we do so basically through the development of policies. Uh, we do research as well as developing the regulations that, that we need set in place before operation. So we have the general objective to maximize the economic and social benefits of the use of the radio spectrum. Uh, so as a spectrum regulator, basically we have a general set of policy objectives and principles which we 
generally try to adhere to. And uh, we make mention of these in a recent document we released. So that document's called the Commercial Mobile Spectrum Outlook. So we put that in place as a general approach to ensuring we have enough spectrum to meet the commercial mobile demands over the next five years. So in that document, we make mention of our general principles. And if you take a look at some of them, you can see how they lend themselves easily to the idea of white space. So talking about changes to technology, you have advancements in technology and capabilities of adapting to and making more flexible use of the spectrum. So again, that's talking about white space there. Uh, in, in especially ensuring that appropriate interference protection measures are in place. You talk about adding databases to the license exempt use and you have a way there of ensuring protection. Hold on, Rima. Uh, we just lost your audio. Um, give us a moment and we'll hopefully get things working again. Uh, Rima, why don't you just go ahead and try to speak if you can hear me and hopefully we can hear you. Uh, we lost her audio. Give us a moment. Is there something you want to try? No, we're all set up here. Okay. Okay, so it's, uh, hold on, Rima, we're working in the, the, the back end of the, uh, it looks like it's actually a local problem, we're hoping. So thank you. Still working. Okay, Rima, can you try speaking now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, so we're back on. Uh, thank you, Rima. All right, please. Okay. All right, so a couple of years ago, we started looking into white space, and of course, the first thing we had to do was take a look at the frequency bands considered and what was in there. So this is just a, a snapshot of the spectrum we were looking at, basically, all TV bands below 698 megahertz, so channels from 54 megahertz up until 698, and you can see the, the num channel numbering convention is there on this slide as well. So looking at the current use of TV broadcasting bands on the next slide, so basically we have over-the-air TV broadcasting, uh, digital and analog full and low power stations as well. We also have something called remote rural broadband systems. So that's basically a fixed internet, broadband internet service that's provided in rural areas across Canada. So that's done on a licensed basis, but no protection from TV broadcasting. And we've got uh, low powered apparatus, so wireless mics. 
And then we also have radio astronomy and medical telemetry. So obviously though we have to consider what's already in the band and protection. So what we've done to date is basically in August of 2011, we released a consultation paper and this is the usual process that we have here. So basically we send out consultation paper asking the questions and to industry to interested stakeholders, uh, various proposals on white space and asking for their comments. And once we come back with their comments, we analyze them and then we release a decision paper. So in October of 2012, we released, uh, I see 2013 on the slide, but it's actually 2012, we released the policy decision framework. So basically a high level decisions that we made to date on white space. And our next step in the process would be to come up with the technical and operational rules for the use of the white space. And we're doing that through stakeholder discussions and I'm going to talk to you about that in a little bit. So just an overview of the decisions we made in the framework. So it basically they're broad decisions in many cases very similar to those in the US. So the key elements are basically allowing white space devices on a license exempt basis and no interference, no protection to all the license services currently in the band. So I've already mentioned those. Uh, we're also, we made the decision to use third party databases based on geolocation in order to manage the use of the white space. And there is no use permitted in channel 37, which is 608 to 614 megahertz. And that is to protect our radio astronomy and medical telemetry services that we have in there. So in terms of the technical parameters, those decisions uh, are yet to be made. They're going to be made in our, dis our technical documents to come. But generally, we agreed in the decision paper to harmonize with the US where possible. So some of the aspects that are a little more unique to Canada, in terms of the digital transition, uh, in Canada, the transition to digital only took place in major markets. So basically in about 28 cities across Canada, the transition was done to digital. However, we still have a number of analog systems in the more rural areas. So about anal uh, 800 analog systems still there to protect. So that's definitely a challenge. We also have the rural remote broadband, those internet systems in rural areas that I talked about. So also a requirement to protect them. And we didn't actually dedicate specific channels for low power use. Uh, given that there's in, in North America, there's still uh, looking at repurposing TV spectrum bands. Uh, we're just going to wait until it stabilizes before looking at uh, designating specific low power uh, apparatus, basically in specific channels. So, And in terms of spectrum sensing, we, we did consider it as an option, but in the end, uh, we're, we initiated our initial rules basically are for geolocation and database registration and uh, spectrum sensing is not an option now but as technology matures it might be something we would consider adding in addition. So just to look at the timelines, uh, I mentioned the consultation and decision which we've done. So now we're into the purple arrow. Basically we're starting next week on the rule the establishing technical rules and operational rules database providers including among other things separation distances and then we have the other document on the technical compliance requirements so things like power limits emission limits so we'll be consulting with stakeholders through these two working groups probably towards the end of september will be done and after that time we'll review what was done and you know, finalize our documents and hopefully publish them by the end of 2013. 
uh, talked about the database approval process which would follow just to give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, essentially, there would be a call for applications for database providers and then we would review the applications and then sign the agreements. We would then evaluate each of the, the white space databases and then once we, we've approved, we would publish the list of designated white space database providers and then we can do this in, on an ongoing basis as database providers apply. So just to look at the process. So right now I mentioned where we're at the stage where we're looking at technical requirements. Uh, the challenges for us, I've mentioned a few challenges. Uh, basically the main one is coming up with the right protection criteria for licensed users of the white space ensuring that they're protected. We, we also have those analog stations to deal with, a number of those. So looking at that. Uh, also, we have to ensure that the, the licensed low power apparatus is protected. So our decision was to allow low power apparatus both on a licensed and unlicensed basis. So in order for the licensed uh, holders to actually be protected, they'll have to register in the white space database to receive protection. The other thing is, so the, the challenge there is you don't always know where the actual wireless mics, for example, will be located. So that is a challenge. Uh, another challenge, not on this slide, but uh, basically on the database requirement side, this is a really a shift in spectrum management. So basically, you know, allowing third party database providers to actually manage the spectrum in a sense. So we really have to get the rules right. We have to think about things like how often will the database providers refresh checking channel of availability. We have to look at security of the information being sent by database providers. So we have to make sure that what, it's one thing to put the right uh, protection criteria in place, but we also have to ensure that it's implemented properly so that it does actually work and protect existing users. So a number of challenges that we're looking at. So in terms of our next steps, basically we're going to go through this consultation process with stakeholders to try to get the rules in place and then we're, we will finalize the rules at Industry Canada. And then we will start to look at the various database administrators. They can start to apply and to be considered. And then we will have an evaluation process where we will evaluate each of the database providers to the rules to ensure there's interoperability. And then simultaneously, I guess in parallel, white space devices could then go through the certification process using the document we have on technical compliance requirements as, as a basis. So I mean, that's pretty much where we're at right now. Looking forward to getting the working groups going starting next week. And we do have a, an email address there. It's bilingual. So we're very proud of that. White Espace Blanc or White Space. So any questions you can send there or at the end of our question period. Thank you, merci. Thank you very much, that was excellent. All right, um, and please um, stay on if possible and we'll have some questions answered, but for, um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Nirwana who became Group Director of Spectrum Policy at Ofcom in 2009 where he's recently been responsible for leading the recent 4G spectrum auction in the UK that raised 2.3 billion pounds. He was also instrumental in the DSO conversion. And I'd like to add two more things. He was responsible for the effort in TV white space and is from Cameroon. So I think he is uniquely qualified to help us today thinking about what we can do here in Africa. So thank you. Let me introduce Dr. Nwani. Good afternoon. Uh, am I on? 
Hi, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry I'm the last speaker of the day, but um, I, I, hope, uh, I hope to do some justice. Uh, maybe I should just start by thanking the organizers uh, in their language. Um, so, je suis très heureux d'être ici à Gitaka aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup pour les organisateurs, même ici, particulièrement les organisateurs locaux comme. Comment tu appelles tu C'est Tijan. C'est aidé à Marine Dou qui m'a qui a arrangé tous mes billets. Je ne l'ai même pas vu. Merci beaucoup. C'est ma première fois ici à Dakar pour 20 ans. Je suis très très heureux d'être ici. Après ça, je veux parler en anglais. So one of the things I wanted to say, one of the things he also introduced me by saying is, je viens de terminer l'exécution d'une vente entre uh, aux entres du spectre orient unique qui a soulevé de, de, de 2.37 uh, milliards de livres au Royaume-Uni. Uh, aussi, j'étais le responsable pour uh, la uh, migration uh, d'analog uh, des radiodiffusions analogiques uh, uh, numériques au Royaume-Uni aussi. D'accord I'm going to just now talk, start talking about what we, what we have done in the UK uh, as part of the path to TV white spaces. So if I can just get the white first slide. Nope. It's a bandwidth problem? You just want to go local. One thing I want to say is, um, as I go through the presentation, I will try and address some of the uh, frustrations that I've heard in the audience about the speed, about uh, how we move as regulators and how we move in a new area like white spaces. Um, classic uh, problems with regulators, but frankly, it's not just a regulatory issue, it's also, frankly, how we interact with industry. So we have gone through a very significant length of consultation processes uh, within Ofcom. I wish, that, I wish I could come onto the slide. Do we just want to go straight back onto the thing directly? Okay. So while was that pulling that out? We have gone through as Ofcom something like five consultations so far uh, in order to get to where we are today. Roughly where we are today is we are now in a position in the UK where we just want to proceed with making it happen over the next 12 to 18 months in the United Kingdom. Um, so th this is the process we have gone through. So in 2007, we, we, when we're looking at the whole area of, uh, of, uh, of interference of, of UHF, we, we decided very clearly that we wanted to license exempt white space devices. Uh, in 2008, we decided in 2009, we decided that geolocation was probably the, the most promising way uh, to proceed uh, in the United Kingdom. It's not in, in any way, shape or form, we're not saying sensing is not important. As I said in South Africa a couple of years back, um, we didn't want the good to be the enemy of the best. Okay, so it's really, really important. So we are going to, as the technology evolves and we start looking at sensing and we think sensing works, then we are going to incorporate sensing. But in the medium term, we've decided that uh, 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 the geolocation approach is the best approach to go through. Then we went, we, we went on to 2010 to start looking at the sort of ex information that we're going to be exchanged between databases on white space devices. Again, those are quite important, very similar to what my colleague in Canada has been describing. And then in 2011, we talked about the, uh, we, 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 we consulted on the license exemption regulations uh, themselves proper for, for, for the devices. So you can see it's been a long running process. The reason I put a slide like this up here in Africa to some degree is to start giving a sense of the fact that you just cannot turn a single regulatory uh, handle and everything works. You have to go through a fair amount of due process. 
And frankly, we had to go through such a due process while the technology was also still maturing uh, 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 in, in, in out there in the marketplace. So uh, in the UK today, there's no doubt about the fact that we are under significant pressure from industry to deploy new services uh, using white spaces. We're just under a lot of pressure. I get a lot of lobbying from industry, from all the major players, some of who are represented here today. We clearly have a duty to secure optimum use of spectrum. Um, but I, I want to really spend a bit more time on this slide because I hear my African friends sometimes thinking this is a... Uh, 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 we, we sort of skip th through some of the implications of this slide, where we, every regulator I know has a duty to optimum use of spectrum, and every regulator I know has a duty to, uh, to promote innovation, which are the two key things on this slide. And the reason I want to spend a second here is if we were actually rewriting most of the statutes that are the basis of most spectrum regulators, now in 2013, I think dynamic spectrum regulation will be a big significant part of that. So the fact that most of our statutes were written back 50 years ago, 75 years ago, in a world where static allocation was the de jure, uh, then that's where we are today. So there's a very strong incentive, very, very strong incentive in my mind for looking at dynamic spectrum allocation. So frankly, I've said publicly uh, many times, and I've been quoted on this several times, Dynamic spectrum allocation is in Nirvana for any good spectrum regulator. It is really the gold bar for any good spectrum regulator because we know clearly that most of our spectrum in most of the places in most of the time is unused. And so what dynamic spectrum allocation really starts doing is it starts taking you to a position where you can really start addressing some of those uh, uh, spectrum efficiencies which are totally inbuilt in the way we manage spectrum today. Uh, the other thing this slide talks about is really about sharing. Uh, we are now moving from a position where in one of the first presentations today you saw all those rooms with, with very clear static allocations and frankly gaps between some of those rooms. You are now going into a position where to use that same analogy you can share uh, most of those rooms subject to not interfering with some of the key primary users. So sharing is really a key driver to what we're doing in, in dynamic spectrum allocation and in white spaces uh, in the UK. I think secondly, the whole innovation story is incredibly important. I, I say, I make no apologies for saying that I think the African continent is going to teach uh, Europe and America a, f a fair amount about wireless innovation. I see some of the innovation happening right now on the continent is just mind boggling. And I think the more we release spectrum and the more we liberalize, one of the key important things about what we're trying to do with white spaces is not licensing it, is license exempting it, which means there's a, it's a liberalized regime, and you let the market and you let some of the innovators and the entrepreneurs on the African continent reign. And that's really one of the key drivers. So when some of my colleagues, the regulators, continue to feel a bit concerned and hold back, I think you should remember that as well, that there really is a chance here. Nous avons l'occasion ici pour l'Afrique to take the first position. We really need to find a way to seize that, uh, to, to seize that opportunity. Because you go to places like Kenya, Nigeria, you see some of the opportunity, and you see some of the work that's being done on, on, on wireless innovation. It's just incredible. And the second thing I'll say on this slide as well is, you heard my colleague from uh, William Stock from, uh, from uh, South Africa saying, in some markets in South Africa, there will be something like 164 megahertz of spectrum in some markets or in some locations totally in prime UHF band, sitting, doing nothing. Uh, for a spectrum regulator who is really worth its salt, that really isn't good enough. And they really must be putting together strategies and very clear plans to do something about that going forward. The other thing I want to just say about the challenges, and uh, in this challenges slide, I would address some of the issues about the frustrations with speed, the frustration of la vitesse, really, really important. So if you look at all the regulators would have to worry, as you heard my colleague in Canada talk about how you protect DTT. So that's digital terrestrial television. Yes, I heard my, my Qualcomm colleague also talk about the fact that what if there was a scenario where there was no DTT in that band? Frankly, in Europe and frankly in the UK, that's not an option. It's just not an option. It could be an option in Africa, but just not an option in Europe, and certainly not in the UK. 
So we do have in the UK a very good understanding of the digital landscape. We've just finished the digital switchover in the UK. So just a very, very good thing. The second thing is PMSA, which is typically wireless microphones and, uh, and, and wireless cameras. So again, it's a very big industry in the UK. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in the UK and Europe. So if you imagine that we had the Olympics in the, in the UK just over the past summer, you can imagine the number of wireless microphones and wireless cameras that were being used to, uh, to do the, uh, the filming and the transmission of audiovisual elements for, that, for those devices. In the UK, we do have the lock that we actually license wireless microphones and wireless cameras. So we do know where they tend to be used and how often they use them. So we've got an organization which does that. In the rest of Europe, frankly, they don't tend to know that. It tends to be license exempt. And so that makes it slightly difficult in the rest of Europe compared than, compared than in the UK. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this slide as well, which makes it difficult for regulators, is you would not find many regulators' uh, statutes which allows them to, 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 do, to use the database model. So the database model is totally untested. So it is not written so far in the UK regulations. So the current UK regulation framework does not support that. So we are now actually working with the government right now as we speak in order to try and get them to include database regulation in the new version of the Communications Act or in the new versions of some of the acts that are going to be coming out shortly. So again, that gives you a flavor of some of the reasons why some of the regulators in the room cannot just click their fingers and then things happen. Because this database approach has to be written in legislation so that we've got the legal powers to be able to proceed to enact uh, those, those legal regulations. And if those, reg uh, those regulations do not exist in statutes, then they have to be written in statutes in the first place before you can actually proceed to, uh, to start implementing them. Even here as well, uh, we need to come up with bespoke arrangements, totally bespoke arrangements as to how we authorize database providers that are typically going to be through contracts between Ofcom and the database providers. Again, very similar to what I think my, I heard from my colleague in, in Canada. Again, that has not been tested. We have to really work through that very carefully. Uh, even the device and the database provider are being licensed differently. So we are licensed exempting the device, but we are, we are contracting with the database providers. So you can see that there are two different regimes there that we have to worry about. And last but by no means least on this slide, we're also saying we have to worry about international standardization. You can say, uh, for me, it's very important that we are going at some pace similarly with the uh, US and Canada because ultimately I want the US guys who, who fly into Heathrow Airport to be able to use the devices in the United Kingdom and vice versa for me to be able to talk to, to their databases when I take my devices to, 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 to the United States. So this is one of those areas where you don't go it alone. You, you, can, you cannot do a, ra a race by yourself, right? To some degree, you really want to drive to drive the ecosystem. You really have to ensure that you've got a few people with you. One, you start driving economies of scale and economies of scope. But two, you start also perfecting the fact that uh, my device should be able to speak to a US database, and the US database, US device should be able to speak to a UK database, and vice versa. And same thing with Canada. And this requires us being able to work out some of those. It will be difficult to start with. We'd have to go through some, uh, all, each country would have to do their own thing. And then but ultimately, at some stage, we need to start working out a way to ensure that uh, these things are able to talk to one another. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to go through and skip most of this slide because we've talked about uh, a lot of the TV white spaces here. Uh, even in the UK, even in the UK, uh, we, we, we do have something like 100 megahertz in quite a few cities. So that's a lot of spectrum for us to sit on doing nothing. So the really key thing, what you also have to worry about is the extent of protection that you afford uh, the existing licensees. And this is something that we have not mentioned here today at all. Uh, it depends on some of the quality of the receivers, the television receivers or the PMSA receivers that you currently have operating within those particular bands. So do you really want to protect to the worst TV receivers? Do you want to protect to the average TV receivers? Do you want to protect to the best TV receivers? And those are some of the issues that regulators, my fellow regulators in the room would also have to worry about. Because if people have moved onto the market, some pretty poor receivers uh, from elsewhere in the world, uh, then the, one of the key questions they would have to ask themselves and answer for themselves in those trials is to, ask, is to certify what sort of receivers they have in the country 
and to see whether they need, they need to protect those sort of level of receivers. Because if they're very poor, the regulator and the government may decide that, that it's far too expensive an exercise to do that. Too close, okay. Uh, so wh where are we now in the UK? So what we're now trying to do in the UK is we are trying to pull all of these things together to just make it happen. So we, we are unlikely to go through any more further consultations in the UK. We just want to understand to pull together a pilot. So this is no longer a trial. This is a real pilot, which if everything goes well, just automatically evolves into the deployment scenario in the United Kingdom, where we can actually test the device op operations, how the device is actually going to work, where we can actually test the the, the contract qualification process, the operations and all the different calculations of the white space availability across all the different parts of the United Kingdom, where Ofcom can actually provide going through a qualifying process for databases and for white spaces listing, because what you do is you come up to the Ofcom website and you see the approved list of white of database providers, then you can go into your IP address and you can get, uh, uh, you can start operating with that particular device. We want to just prove Ofcom's DTT calculations, the results. In the case of the UK, as somebody said this morning, for the public, for PMSC, so that's the, uh, the wireless cameras and wireless microphones, we are actually able to get data from the PMSC provider every three hours. So that's going to be as close to dynamic as possible. So we're going to be up updating our database on an every three hours basis. And if possible in the future, we're going to do it even faster. Then we also want to be able to test for interference management and for test for enforcement. So let me give an example of what I mean by enforcement. So effectively, the way we have, de we have designed the database is almost as if we've got a knob on it. We've got two key things on the database. One, we've got an off button. So we can switch off the database if we think interference is becoming a problem nationwide. So we can actually switch it off. So there's no excuse for not doing it, for regulators not doing it, because you can always switch it off. If you, don't, if you don't have to switch it off, you also have the option of turning the volume knob down, right? So you can turn the volume knob down in order to reduce the availability of white space devices if you think there's a problem with, to do with interference. Now we want to test all those processes. We, so one of the things we're trying to do in this particular pilot right now is to test those processes specifically to do with if push comes to shove in some particular locations, we can just switch it off. If not, we can turn the volume database down, the, the volume up down. If we think we are being too cautious, and we are going to start with a very cautious approach, we can turn the, 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 the volume the volume knob up. So that's really the analogy, and that's why we want to go through this process of actually testing everything for real. So testing how the, the, we are going to qualify the database guys, the, how the device operations are going to work, how the calculation engine works how the interference management is going to work, how the enforcement is going to work, and make all of that happen. And so we announced that a month ago uh, with a press release, and we're now having all the industry in the United Kingdom now really trying to engage with us to just make this happen uh, right now. And assuming that this pilot works, we are going to move to success, to full solution uh, sometime in 2014. Uh, that's the date we've got so far, Q3 2014. If we can do it any earlier, uh, we, are, we are going to do it. So that's what we're doing now in the UK with respect to that. So what, what next? Uh, I just want to say, <clears throat> look, I'm not, a lot of us have already talked about s s uh, spectrum supply outstripping demand. That's definitely the case in the United Kingdom. We've just done the auction in the United Kingdom. The moment we finished it, people started asking us questions about more spectrum. It, does, it just happens uh, that, that way all the time. And all this slide is really talking about this opportunistic and dynamic spectrum access is really something that is quite key uh, uh, to the Ofcom landscape, and we're going to continue to prioritize that. Uh, there's something in, the UK, in, the, in Europe called license shared access. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but it's just to say um, this, is, this is something that the European Union is quite uh, passionate about. Uh, we do, all I'm just going to say on this particular slide is we quite support it. Um, the fact that we are going to be license exempting uh, uh, white space devices in the United Kingdom does not mean that we don't support the license shared access approach, which is also being pushed by the European Union. To us, any approach of 
driving more sharing and driving more dynamic spectrum allocation is a good thing. Um, and that's all I really need to say about that. So we are going to be quite supportive of, of, of licenses, uh, license sharing in the United Kingdom. Similarly, uh, uh, licenses tend to be tradable in the United Kingdom as well. Uh, spectrum can also be leased. So we've, we've got a very sophisticated uh, regime in the United Kingdom where we've got leasing arrangements, we've got sharing arrangements, and we even have got a situation where we can even enable the public sector to trade their spectrum back to the private sector. Again, we, we're doing all of that in the United Kingdom. And again, it sits quite nicely with license share, this license shared approach. Uh, for me, just to come to the conclusion, one of the things I just wanted to say really is, is it's a question of policy. Uh, and I want to address specifically the, the African context because I think being a son of the soil of Africa, I understand it a bit closely about some of these situations in, uh, in Africa. And it goes back to this whole issue to do with uh, la frustration de la vitesse, uh, the frustration with the speed. So if I'm being honest, um, white space devices, which I'm very passionate about, as I hope you can see, was probably, uh, me leading the spectrum regulator in the UK, was probably num my number 12 or number 13 priority. Okay? That was probably my number 12 or number my number 13 priority. Because I had an auction to run, I had analog to digital switchover to do, I had 61 62 clearance to do, I had to fix all the radars in the United Kingdom, did that, did that, did that, right? So across Ofcom, so, so if you just leave Spectrum for, for uh, my group for that matter, across Ofcom, it was probably number 20. It was probably number 20, 20 most important project across Ofcom. So if you come back to my colleagues here in Africa, well, we just have to be patient about this. The reality is, if it was number 12 for me and number 20 across Ofcom, what, what, what number, what position do you think this would be across my colleagues here in Africa? Right. What, what number do you think this would be across my colleagues in NCC in Nigeria or, or in CCK in Kenya or in TRB in Cameroon? It's just when they have got issues to do with consumer protection, they've got issues to do with scamming, they've got issues to do with mobile termination rates, they've got issues to do with, with, uh, with consumer protection. That would make it drop significantly well below, below the radar. And that's just the reality. And there's a benefit that, at least for me in Ofcom, I had a pretty big team. We've got something like 370 people in total working on spectrum-related issues. So by the time I go down to number 20 project, I still got some good resources to put on it. If you've got much smaller regulators here in my, in my, in my continent in Africa, and I've got 100 people in that regulator, by the time they go to number 50 project, there is nobody, right? So this, I think, is some of the reality you find on the continent. So I think it's really important that uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of my colleagues, the regulators in the audience, but I know this for a fact because I know how this is how we regulators work. It's quite difficult. So you must, those of us in the room who are really passionate about this, must find a way to make it relevant to the regulators by either packaging some of the things we're doing in white spaces along with other projects which we think are very important to the regulators. You may want to package it together. So I'm very pleased with what uh, I think as Elizabeth said before with respect to the Corpon's perspective, where she was suggesting the future of UHF, maybe the quest, exam question should be one more of the future of UHF in Africa and not just necessarily uh, uh, white spaces uh, in Africa. So I just throw that to the floor because I know some of the frustration that happens when we don't move that fast. But I, we also need to realize that regulators are also working with very constrained resources and there's some bit, pretty big difficulties and big priorities we should also have to worry about. And if we work together in this room, I'm sure we can work out a way in which, uh, uh, in, in which we can try and get this up the agenda in a way that is proportionate and realistic uh, to, to the operator. So je veux conclure que il faut que nous ce song l'occasion. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. That was excellent. To just so there must be questions. I realize we here on the stage are standing and on the screen are standing be between you and, and dinner and a break and cocktails. Uh, but I'd love to take a few questions. So if there's anyone who's got a question, please raise your hand. I'm going to start with um, the gentleman in the back, and I'll come to you next. So a microphone is coming. 
And uh, Rima and, and um, Ira, I will stand here in front of the um, front of the camera so you can see me at least as as the questions come. And just give me a thumbs up if you can hear what the question is. Okay, we'll start here up front. Please introduce yourself. Merci, c'est encore moi, Tidiane Sec, professeur à l'université. Est-ce que je peux avoir deux questions? Je peux prendre deux questions? Can I have two questions? Okay. Sure. Euh, question numéro un, euh, j'aimerais savoir, euh, est-ce qu'il va y avoir une base de données pour chaque pays qui désire faire de la gestion dynamique? Ou bien, est-ce qu'on va aller vers des bases de données distribuées? OK. 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 I will go Thank to... You. I'll go, Sorry I'll go to make English. you do okay. that. Uh, my first question, if I can have two. Uh, the number one is, will we go uh, with one database per country or a sort of uh, distributed database and, uh, and probably in the future a system like a DNS? Um, so actually, I think, Ira, since you worked through this issue first, I'll give you the opportunity to answer first. But I think it'd be good to also get Rima's and Dr. Nwana's perspective. Could you repeat the question? So the question is, will there be, why did you choose to have multiple database providers? And do you think that's the right decision now at this point? No. No. Ah, okay, it's a different question. So I, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. So maybe, um, let me have Google speak to that first and then some other opinions. So from our perspective, we're trying to build a database that is... To, uh, to try to, to, you know, do better just uh, with, with competition, which is always a good thing. Um, also, there was a lot of interest and uh, we... We also know that there's a lot of interest in trying to work this concept to other bands. Yeah. And uh, again, um, to, to the competition aspect and, um, and, 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 and providing a, a means for. Okay, Ira, I have to apologize. Uh, the, the connection is so bad. Continually strive. <laughs> okay, Ira, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but unfortunately the connection was bad enough. We're only getting half the words, and it actually was a different question than what I repeated. The real question, I think, was why have um, one database or set of database per country? Why not have those databases cover multiple countries? And actually, the strategy is to come up with a device to database protocol. Um, and we're working with the, through the IETF to come up with something called PAWS or PAWS, Protocol for Accessing White Space Databases, that allows any database to f or any device to find, figure out what jurisdiction it's in, and then work with that particular database or set of databases that are in that jurisdiction. And hopefully, from a device perspective, it's transparent and it doesn't matter, it's just based on location. Um, so far, what we've seen is every single jurisdiction has had different uh, sets of rules or variations. For example, in Canada, there's the rural services that need to be protected. In Ofcom, it's a different methodology in terms of how the protection is done um, from, from the United States. So there's a reason to have it be different in each geography. Uh, but our hope is that the device can have just one interface that it can use and one method for accessing that so we can get the, the global scale that I think is necessary for this to go forward. Next question. Right, I, 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 I agree. And from a device standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I would imagine that as we see more implementations around the world, that's where the device market's going to get driven to. From the database perspective, uh, we, we have, at least here, um, some legal issues where we're, um, we're really struggling with on how to implement that. And just in the, in, in the immediate future, in just 
we've, we've been working very closely with, with Canada uh, since we share a very large border on how to implement this across, just across the one border. And one of the issues that we're struggling with here is given that the database providers are private, it's a matter of whether we have legal authority to, um, to have a, a private entity or um, mandate that a private entity share data with a uh, corporation or an entity in a foreign market. And so we're trying to figure out how, wh whether we could do that or if we need to create a kind of workaround maybe through the, the governmental entity, through the FCC to provide a conduit for the data. And we may need to work through that from another perspective. But from, you know, and, and again, that might be different in other jurisdictions and other administrations, but from the U.S., we're for two orders with other, other, other administrations, Canada to the north, Mexico to the south. So from global implementation of TV white space, Okay. Perspective. Right. We don't have to worry about what's happening. All right, right. I, uh, so I get it. It's not a huge issue for us. It may be a case. Ira, we're, we're having a bad connection problem, so why don't we just move on? I think appreciate the feedback, and we'll hopefully for the next question, we'll have better connectivity. It seems to be going up and down. Okay, please. Okay, okay. So, thank you very much. The, the second question um, uh, deal with um, your your integration. You 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 say that um, in your uh, in your situation, you have something about twenty projects, high priority projects. So the TV white space subject will be very low in your priority. Okay. Uh, my question is. If we ask the same question to the African regulatory, how many, really, how many uh, priority projects that they have right now, each of them? And I think that if we ask this question, probably uh, this subject will be uh, in a good position. Please. I I, I do not necessarily want to speak for my uh, African regulatory colleagues, but all I can say, the point I was trying to make there was even if with a very firmly independent regulator like Ofcom, where it was my decision to prioritize all the spectrum projects, it is my decision to prioritize all the spectrum projects within Ofcom. And I'm being honest with you to say, even on my own prioritization, and I'm a passionate person about this project was number 12, 13. Across the organization, because the spectrum projects were quite important, this was probably around number 20. All I'm saying is, if you try and use that same methodology across my African regulatory colleagues, you would find that that's why this probably doesn't feature in the top 30, 40, 50 projects. I spoke to a regulator last week, I'm not going to mention the name, and it just didn't feature in the top 50 projects. And it's not as if they don't have other more deserving projects. They do. Interconnection rates is incredibly important to solve in the African continent because you see some of the rates we pay in the continent are too high. Mobile termination is quite important. Spectrum pricing is quite important. Enforcement is quite important. Uh, consumer protection, people are being slammed on the continent, scams, etc. I could just go on and on. I sit on the board of Ofcom and that's the problems we look at on the day on the day to day basis. And those same problems also face my colleagues here who don't have the same resource levels that I'm lucky to have in the United Kingdom. And that's all I'm saying. And I'm saying you have to find a way to combine this project with other projects that really matter to them <laughs> to make it happen. Was that a compliment now? Merci. Thank you. OK, two more questions. OK. Hello. 
Uh, please introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Mr. Chijuke Eke. I'm from Nigeria, and um, I am on the board of WIF Tech, Nigeria Limited. I'm quite excited with um, the contributions of the professor, but I also key to some idea that uh, the professor raised that was not properly treated. He said, going forward, uh, initially, what we see is this country-specific silo approach of um, databases. But whether, going forward, it would not be wise to, quoting him, adopt the DNS approach, which is to say, find a way of um, sharing uh, information by devices, uh, looking at the region of authority quite all right, but being able to say, well, look, if this, I'm there, and I need something outside my jurisdiction, can't I go there and fetch it? I suppose that's what we say, and that excited me. So I would need the professor to be a little more, um, throw more light in that, because if we're going to go country by country by country by country by country, um, from my very limited um, experience and view, uh, that means uh, looking at the prioritization, which is a reality, uh, some of us might, um, have to take a second look at the delivery period for this in our environment. Thank you. Um, yeah, why don't I give, um, Rima, do you want to have a chance to respond to this as someone who has to work, you know, with a neighboring country and then, and, you know, are there, are there ways that you see to accelerate it and make it simple? Because you are thinking about the problem of how you work with a, a neighboring country and move quickly. I'm not sure we can hear you yet, Rima. Still can't hear you. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, seems to be a bit of a delay, but uh, basically I think Ira captured this in, in this previous response. Uh, for us, we do have an established process where we discuss with our only neighboring country, the US, and we do so on a regular basis and we come up with arrangements for sharing across the border. So we do keep the communication line open and and look to how we're going to do in the board as well as device straightforward in our case. Okay, so thank you, Rima. So w again, it was working great, and then the connection became um, strained. And, but what we heard was you have close coordination with your neighbors and frequent communication you're working to harmonize, I think, in summary. Um, if you can add to that, thank okay. you. Hello? All right. Okay. Um, again, I think I do have a lot of sympathy with the genesis of my colleagues over there, the professor's question. It's something that we, we, we worry about quite a fair bit. Uh, so I'll give you two or three answers to the question. The first really is you could localize it to be a border problem because these devices are going to be sitting at some particular coordinate requesting uh, frequencies. And then the database is going to come back and say you can proceed in the case of the UK with this amount of power, et cetera, because it knows the configuration of the device. Uh, so it, you could say it's more of a local problem. And on that particular case, you can localize and you can feed in that data in respective databases of the different, reg the different regulators or the different geographies to solve that problem. But I think you were, uh, this, there's a second reason why regulators may do things differently. As I've just given you the example of the UK, we happen to license all program making and special events, so that all wireless microphones and wireless cameras. So that means we've got, we've got up-to-date data that can go into our databases about the use of such devices. In my neighbor France and my neighbor Ireland, they don't necessarily do that. So that means I'm doing, I've got more information which I can put in my local databases in the United Kingdom that they may not necessarily 
So there is a harmonization issue. But I think your, your substantive question was, more, was bigger than that. It was basically saying, is it really the right thing to do for all the different countries to be doing the same thing at the same time? And I think this way it becomes a question of policy because you would need to harmonize the legislation across those regions. Because why would I want to start implementing a database conjointly with my neighbor if it's, we're not working to harmonize a set of rules and the regulations in how those would work? And that is one thing that I think in Africa we need to get much better at, regional uh, working together of regulators. is not something that happens as well as I think it should do. In Europe, it works much better than I see working on my, on my continent here. Thank you. Okay, one last question. The gentleman here. Right. My name again is uh, Engineer Austin Waoluna, the head of Spectrum Admin NCC Nigeria. I see harmonization is key in this business of TV white space. And I know that ITU has played very significant roles when you talk about harmonization. I was wondering what part IT is playing in this TV white space issue, talking about the databases. Steve, I thought you were quite... <laughs> You want Steve to re-answer the question? Uh, in, in the proceedings from WRC 2012, um, it was stated that um, uh, the TV white spaces were acknowledged and that no um, uh, decision from the World Radio Congress was required on TV white spaces because of their dynamic status and that uh, because they can be allocated on a, on a uh, dynamic basis that, that the, the, there isn't any particular need for countries to coordinate. They can, they can operate ind independently, really, and assign them you know, according to their own environment. So you heard um, Canada has you know, certain rural uh, 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 broadband uh, requirements, and, the, and uh, uh, the, you know the U.S. and, and U.K. have um, uh, wireless microphone requirements. It, is, it, it varies, and, and, and I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah I, I think there are variations. And that is the same way so many other things in ITU vary and uh, we come to compromises on issues. I think there is a need for ITU to be, perhaps they have said it that because of the differences, that there is no need for a harmonized database. But I think, given what I had here today, I think there is need. If people have to move devices across countries, it means ITU really need to play in this. Thanks. Well, Augustine, I think there is a difference between a functional database in some geography and the protocol for the device to be able to talk to the database. So there's no doubt about the fact that there must be a unified protocol for me to be able to talk to whatever database, non protocol database, right? There must be. But the function, how the database internally works does not necessarily need harmonization or standardization. Okay. Are you, you all right. So I'd like to say thank you to Professor Rwana, Rima, and, and Ira, thank you. If anybody has questions, feel free to come up. And to our colleagues abroad, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you. Silent. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a good day? Round of applause for you guys. I have only one regret. I cannot sit with each of you for half an hour. It's a fantastic meeting place happening here right now. Enjoy it for me, please. Um, what's next? Say dinner. 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 So, uh,
the buses will leave at seven from the parking of the hotel. Um, les bus vont quitter à 19h à partir des parkings de l'hôtel. Et vous les reconnaîtrez parce qu'il y aura les charmantes hôtesses de, uh, pour vous indiquer où se trouvent les bus. <laughs> Someone's clapping for the uh, charming hostesses. Um, et donc nous avons prévu un dîner que nous espérons vous plaira. Un peu de musique live. Uh, le Sénégal est un pays où la scène de musique live est extrêmement développée. Donc, uh, somebody said English. So we have a great live music scene. We hope you'll enjoy it. Enjoy dinner, but not too late. We want you all at 8.30 sharp. It will be uh, on an ocean front, a bit cold, so windy, a bit cool, so grab something uh, for that. Ça, on sera au bord de la mer, un peu devant, ce sera un peu frais. Uh, Habillez-vous en conséquence. <laughs> C'est où c'est où Pour ceux qui connaissent Dakar, for those who know Dakar very well, Lagon, au Lagon 2, le restaurant du Lagon 2, I see. Lagon 1, pardon. Et vous savez, les, moi, je vais aller dans un bus et je ne vais plus me poser des questions. I hop on a bus and I won't ask any question until I get there. Um, I hope you really enjoy it. Thanks again for everybody for this first day. Let's have a fantastic second day. Thank you all.